so by five is a I'm daddy, okay? It's a five. It's a by five is about the concert. And I go to school. This is video number 21 in Film Mechanics. So this is the third video in section seven now. And we're in part B where we're looking at fluid flow around immersed bodies. We're gonna focus more in this video on lift. We looked at drag in the last video where drag was the force acting in the direction of motion. Whereas lift is perpendicular to that, so lift acts upwards and downwards. And we think of lift as acting upwards, but there can be down forces as well. And then we're also going to look at spin. And so we're going to look at um, spin on baseballs and golf balls. And spin can be really important for the forces that act on this flow over objects. So we're going to be looking at that in this video as well. Okay, so here's the breakdown for section seven again. So you can see we're gonna be covering lift and spin. And then there is an example that'll follow this video showing lift and drag of an airfoil. Okay, so now we're looking at the lift force. So it's really similar to what we had in drag. In this case, the lift forces are really just distinguished from the drag forces because they're normal to the free stream direction. So they're normal to the incoming velocity. So that's what causes, lift causes the plane to lift into the sky upwards away from the ground. And the downforce in vehicles, so it's like, we can think of it as like a negative lift when you push the vehicle down towards the ground. That pushes it, you know, in the opposite direction downwards against the ground and also normal to the free stream direction. So lift follows the exact same pattern. We've got pretty much the same coefficient there, right? Instead, we've got the lift force and AP is labeled very specifically because it becomes a little bit tricky, right? Some of these areas can be tricky. So this is the plan form area, which is the area when you're looking down above a wing, right? So these are some wings here. If I'm sort of, I'll draw like an eye here. If you're looking down that way, you know, you'd see the wing like basically as like a, a rectangular shape. And so that right there is the plan form area. It's normally the area that's basically normal to the direction of the force, right? So the lift force is pulling up that way and it's gonna be acting on like an area when you look down that looks like that. That's plan form area. Now, we talked a little bit about lift, what causes lift, and it's the fact that the velocity is increased over the top of these airfoils. As it travels up this way, the velocity is increased. As it comes down, you know, this way, it slows down. Slower velocity has a higher pressure and it pushes the wing up. C is what we call cord. I'll just give that a quick label here. And we're showing a symmetrical and a non-symmetrical airfoil here. And the angle of attack as well, generally the airfoil's rotated, but you can also show this by like showing the angle here, right? The angle at which you approach that airfoil is what changes um, as you rotate the airfoil. So really similar to drag, right? We have mostly experimental data for this. So these are the plots shown here. And again, lift and drag really go hand in hand, right? There's a reason we're learning these two basically together. So you see plots like this. And again, we've got sort of two sets. So on the left here, you have the uh, conventional airfoil and the two plots on the right are showing that laminar flow section. So you've got the lift coefficient, again, plotted versus angle of attack, right? And we know as the angle of attack is increased, you know, up till about this point, the lift coefficient is just getting higher and higher and higher. So as the plane's trying to take off, you want a really high lift coefficient. And then the interesting point here, you have a sudden point here, that's showing stall as we talked about earlier. So that's the point where your lift coefficient will just suddenly dramatically drop because you've stalled off. Your angle of attack was too high and the airflow could not stay attached to your wing anymore. Correspondingly, right, you also have angle of attack and drag coefficient plotted immediately below it. And as we know, as you increase that angle of attack, you see the drag coefficient just goes up and up and up and up because now the wing you know, is facing the flow more. There's a lot more uh, pressure drag associated with that. And so the drag coefficient is going a lot higher, meaning the aircraft has to put a lot more power in to fight against the drag forces and move itself forward quickly, right? The laminar airfoil is similar. These guys tend to operate better in a much lower angle of attack because you remember really the idea here is you want it the flow to stay as laminar as possible so we're seeing a, a lower you know maximum lift coefficient the stall occurs at a lower angle of attack that's its stall point here and you can see the drag coefficient so if you're in this zone down here you actually have very low drag coefficients and then they spike up right and that's generally where you're sort of flipping into turbulence there so these laminar flow sections will operate better if you can keep the flow a little slower, you don't need as dramatic of an angle of attack, right? So 
if you sort of compare the two side by side, right, you can see if you're in that zone uh, down here, there's a much lower drag coefficient for those airfoils. Now I'm gonna show another video that shows stall. It zooms in a little more. I think it's an interesting take on the stall example here. Okay, so I'll hit play, and then you can see the separation is very close to that leading edge there, and it's actually showing, let me play that again in a little more detail here, what's going on in that wake region, right? So a lot of the vortices and turbulence that's going on in the wake region right here. So let's take one more look at that, right? So separated flow, right? The flow's not attached, and you're getting this very chaotic flow in the wake region at the top of the airfoil here. So we're zoomed in, and another point we can see here is a stagnation point down here. Let me play that one more time. All right. So that's showing a closer view of that uh, leading edge separation there. Okay, so our mission here is to really understand, you know, how do we generate lift? How do we avoid stall? How, as engineers, you know, can we make designs that have really good lift? How do we have to balance that with the fact that we're increasing drag? All of these things are the types of questions we need to understand as we march through this section. So what we're looking at here is the way in which stall has influenced our laminar section here. So again, we're just sort of plotting coefficients a pressure coefficient and you can see that for the angle of about one degrees there you're still fine because when you follow through this pressure you don't end up with an adverse pressure gradient adverse meaning you're going from low pressure to high pressure but then when you have the angle of attack going up to 1.5 degrees right there you can see now when you look at the pressure coefficient it goes down and comes back up so you have a adverse pressure gradient here where you're going from a low to a high pressure and that's not conducive to the laminar flow so this is the NACA 66-015 that's the laminar one so you can see again when you look at that drag plot and the corresponding lift coefficients here that when you get that adverse pressure gradient, so that was shown at 1.5 degrees, so out here at about 1.5 degrees, that's what's the uptick in the drag here was due to that separation. So you've got a plot like this basically showing you what's going on along the surface of the airfoil. Okay, now we've talked quite a bit about how lift and drag have a lot of interplay. So what you've got in this plot, it's called a lift drag polar, lift drag polar polar and you really want to know as a designer what's the relationship between the lift and the drag and the idea is we want to have a high CL over CD ratio so in a plot like this lift coefficients here drag coefficients here we want to be like up here right where lift coefficients really high and drag coefficient is as low as possible so again we're looking sort of we're comparing these two types of airfoils the conventional one and the laminar one and we're showing their operational points here so you generally use the conventional that's the lift coefficient you generally want to operate here's a where you operate optimally with the laminar flow section and you can see their lift over drag coefficient ratios there very high and a little bit better on the laminar flow section so you're kind of trying to be as close to like this region as you can where you have high CL and low CD. So as a designer, that's that's really what you're looking for, right? It's a comparison between the lift coefficient and the drag coefficient. Because if you can generate a lot of lift, I mean, that's great. But if your drag is increasing by a disproportional amount, then you're not very good, right? This especially comes into play on race car teams, right? Especially Formula One, where you're very high end. You want to have that lift. And in that case, it's the negative lift, right? It's a downforce. So your tires are pressed down into the road a little more, meaning you have more grip, meaning you can corner better, but you don't want to sacrifice your drag coefficient too much, right? So you need that lift to give you the cornering speed, but the drag that come al comes along with it is very undesirable for a race car, particularly in the straightaways, right? So you have to remember there's a real interplay between lift and drag. You never really get anything for free, right? So you're always sacrificing. You're always, as a designer, really making decisions at sort of what price you're gonna pay. You know you're gonna get some more lift, it's gonna come at the price of an increased drag. Okay, there's a few more things we can look at here in terms of lift that are very interesting. So as I mentioned, right, as this top figure shows here, you're getting this high pressure level on the bottom and this low pressure on the top. It's shown here with sort of pluses and minuses. So what wants to happen is at the end of the wing, right, like a lot of those experiments are showing sort of wings that go on forever. But wings in reality are finite, and when you hit the end, what's gonna happen is that high pressure air is really very dramatically gonna wanna flow to that low pressure region. We know that fluid wants to flow from high pressure to low pressure, and so that effect causes this trailing vortex here that you can see, so it's going from high to low, so each of these arrows is sort of demonstrating that as well. And let me show you a video of that because it's pretty cool to see. 
Okay, so they've set up these smoke patterns here, and then I'll push play here, and they're going to have an aircraft move through it. And just watch it how dramatic these vortices are, the wingtip vortices that are generated by this aircraft. Wow, right? That's incredible. I think we have to watch that again. Okay, so I'm going to hit play here again. Let's watch as the aircraft moves through just how dramatic these vortices are. Here it comes. Oh, that's incredible, right? So you see those trailing vortices there created in the smoke. It lets us visualize those patterns. Okay, so that causes quite a lot of problems, practically speaking, right? One of which is if you have two aircraft flying close together, you have to be careful of that trailing vortex because it disturbs the air in such a way that could throw off your aircraft if you get caught in it. So when planes fly in formations often, they have to be very careful. One of the things they're trying to avoid is those trailing vortices. Also, you're creating a downwash velocity. So you're pushing the flow. See how these arrows are pushing it downwards. You end up pushing the flow behind the wing downwards. And the net effect of that is that it changes the way the air is flowing over the wing itself because this wing, this air that comes off the backside of the wing is actually pushed downwards. And the net effect of that is that it sort of changes the influence of the angle of attack because now the air coming off the back isn't actually flowing straight off the wing. It's flowing kind of down because of this downwash here. So that can cause a uh, reduction in the lift because it's sort of diminishing by a little bit the, the angle of attack the wing experiences. So again, we have sort of plots. It's very experimental, right? One of the things we'll talk about first is the aspect ratio. So aspect ratio is AR shown over here, and that is this B squared over AP. And we can think of this B as like the um, wingspan it's called. So B is wingspan, and then divided by the planform area. And so we remember this distance basically right here, that's the chord length. So when we substitute in, right, we have B squared, the planform area in this case is basically looking down at a rectangle. So it's B times C. So the aspect ratio simplifies to just the wingspan divided by the chord length. And this is of course for a rectangular planform. So then what these plots are showing us here is the lift coefficient on this axis here and the geometric angle of attack. So what's shown when aspect ratio is infinity, that means you basically have a wing where the wingspan extends forever and you don't have any of these end effects, the trailing vortex. And then if the aspect ratio is the real life aspect ratio we just calculated, you have that second curve there. And you notice the difference between the two is shown here, right? So what's happening is there's a reduction in the effective angle of attack, right? So to generate the same amount of lift, so basically the lift right here and the lift right here, you need a much higher angle of attack in the real airfoil than you do in the one that has the infinite aspect ratio. So that change in angle of attack there means you have to have a higher angle of attack to generate the same amount of lift when you're dealing with a real airfoil to counterbalance those end effects. Same type of effect is happening here with the drag coefficient where you have an increase of drag coefficient as well because of that loss of, of lift and those vortices, you're getting more drag off the wing as well. So both of those things are plotted there. And then of course the question is, well, how do you counter this? And there's two things we might've seen before. You see this very often on race cars. When they have wings, they'll have end plates on their wings. What those end plates were doing was they were basically mounted on the side of the wing to prevent the flow from going around the side. So generally on, on race cars, you see end plates and on wings, if you look out the window, now that I've mentioned this, you'll notice that most of the commercial aircraft you fly on, or if you're at the airport and you just take a look out the window there and you look at all the different aircraft, they'll have a winglet, what's called a winglet, and it comes up over the side of the wing like this. Now that I've mentioned it, it's hard not to notice. I always find myself looking for these things as well when I'm on aircraft. So it comes up the side like that. So if you're looking at the wing from the rear, it sort of looks like this, right? It has a little winglet, you know, and the body of the aircraft is like here. And so the wing comes up a little bit and that, is increasing the length of the wing, right? So you're keeping that lift now. It's keeping the air that wants to travel from the bottom to the top. It's blocking it from going through there now, right? So it can't go that path anymore. And so the benefit is like the wing hasn't increased. So aircraft are limited sometimes in what runways they can use and how they can maneuver and how long their wings are. So by putting a little winglet on the end like this, you can actually have higher lift, so increase the effective length of the wing without actually making the wings longer. 
And so that's why I don't think I've uh, actually ever seen a commercial aircraft that doesn't have winglets. They all have winglets at the side. And uh, same thing with race vehicles. They'll have the end plates on the edges of their wings to prevent those vortices. And, and also because they want to control the vortices. So they can design them in such a way that they'll get nice tight vortices that travel back away from the vehicle. And you can see that in a wind tunnel if you have a smoke tracer. So finally, we're going to talk about takeoff and landing. Takeoff and landing is really important. So it takes quite a bit of fuel for planes to both take off and land. So especially for shorter flights, they're using quite a bit of their fuel to accomplish this. And that's why you'll notice planes will take off into the wind. So they'll face the wind, meaning that if you have an aircraft like this and it wants to take off, the wind direction will generally be going this way because what happens then is over its wings, it'll have a higher air velocity over its wings meaning that it's actually a little bit easier for it to generate lift because the wind speed coming over the wings provides like a quicker velocity. And so you'll see airports, they have, um, small airports have those socks to show which way the wind is blowing and the planes will take off into the wind and that makes sure they can have more lift. Now, an interesting question is, so when they're landing, right, when they're landing, do you think they would want to be landing into the wind or landing with the wind? So that's an interesting thing to think about, right? Like you might think you'd want to be the opposite, but we know they do land into the wind. Now that that's, could be a question of the fact that because planes take off into the wind and you don't want them to crash, planes you might think would have to also land facing into the wind too. So it's just maybe the price they pay so that airports are safer. But that's not actually true. It's actually better even if planes had any choice of how they wanted to land, they would still land into the wind. And that's because when the aircraft is coming into land, it wants to make its velocity relative to the ground as low as possible. So it's coming into the ground and it wants to be able to come to a stop. And you've probably seen this when aircraft land, they break as hard as they possibly can, right? So if you're facing into the wind, that means the aircraft can slow down quite a bit and it uses that wind velocity here to actually keep itself lifted off the ground at a lower velocity so that it can touch down at a lower speed and not have to brake quite as hard. So that brings us to a really interesting effect here. When we're talking about landing and takeoff, we can have a balance here. You write the equation like this. What that's saying is, the weight of the aircraft, so that's the force you're trying to counterbalance with its lift, right? If you wanna keep that aircraft perfectly steady in the air, you're gonna to have to balance the weight and the lift will balance exactly here and here, right? And the lift can be rewritten like this. So the lift force again is our lift coefficient, half rho V squared A. Okay, now the question is we wanna get, especially for landing, you wanna get the speed as low as possible. So if you just rewrite this equation, and solve for v instead and you say okay i want to look at this velocity for a second here now if i want to know how to make that as small as possible so that's why i've written it there as v minimum so we want the velocity to be as low as it possibly can but still keep the aircraft in the air right so have the lift balancing the weight then when you look at this expression here of the velocity right if you want that to be as small as possible you can't really do anything about the weight well, you could, but you don't want to start throwing stuff overboard, right? So let's say you can't do anything about the weight. Um, the air density is going to stay the same too. So I will circle in green the things we can change. We potentially can change, we want to have the max lift coefficient. So we want this to be really big, right? If this term is going to be small, these terms are on the bottom. So that needs to be really big and area needs to be really big too. So what can we do to increase that? Well, we probably know this again if we've flown on commercial flights and taken a look out the window. What they do is extend flaps. And so extending these flaps only when you really need them at landing and takeoff can actually help you quite a bit because it can reduce that velocity that you need to hit to have your weight and your lift balance, right? So we've got a double slotted configuration shown here, a slotted flap and then no flaps. And you can see each one has its corresponding lift coefficients. It's dramatically higher when you release the flaps. And of course that plan form area increases as well. So for the same angle of attack, when you release those flaps, you can get a much higher lift coefficient. Now, as we would expect, right, on this plot here is drag. You've got your lift drag polar. So yeah, you release all those flaps, right? You get more lift, but you also get more drag. For example, in the double slotted case there, quite a bit more drag, but because your velocity can be reduced in that case, 
it's still better both for takeoff and landing, particularly for landing though, actually because at landing, the drag is not really that big of a deal. So when the aircraft lands, it actually leaves its flaps down because there's a sort of aerodynamic braking there, right? Where because you have such a high drag coefficient, that's actually gonna help slow down the aircraft. So remember, you want to slow down the aircraft, right? So the drag's not such a big deal. That's why there's actually laws. The FAA has a restriction on how much drag you can have to make sure that aircraft really have enough velocity to keep their lift high enough. So for landing, they definitely capitalize though on some of that drag to reduce their speed. Okay, so I think that covers the lift. So in the next video, we're gonna be looking at applications of this lift and drag material from section seven on vehicles, specifically applications in auto racing. So here, I'll just give a bit of an introduction here, uh, summarizing a lot of the concepts we talked about. So you can see on this car here, we're again, sort of mapping the pressure on the surface, that the same kind of pressure plots we've seen above, we can also show uh, on the vehicle itself here, if you plot the pressure at each surface point, in a cross-section view of a car like this, when the pressure is higher than the free stream pressure, it's blue, and when the pressure is lower than the free stream pressure, it is orange. So at the front of the vehicle, where we have the air being brought to a stop, we know that we're gonna have an increase of pressure there. We have lift generated here, the same reason you do on an airfoil because the velocity is accelerating over the top of the hood there. And so those lift forces are pulling upwards. Then as it has to flow into the windshield here, you're getting a pressure pushing back in that direction. So you can see, you know, lift is broken up as being like this way and drag is broken up as being this way. So each of these things contributes sort of a little bit of both, right? So this guy here pushes down on the vehicle, but also pushes backwards against it. So it's a lift and a drag. Now, as the air again has to speed up and flow over the top here, velocity goes higher, pressure goes down, so you've got quite a bit of lift here. As the velocity squeezes down on the bottom, we'll talk about this quite a bit because those are ground effects. We can also use these to our advantage to pull the car against the ground. So as the velocity goes up here, pressure goes down as well, pulls the vehicle down against the ground. We're also showing this wake region right here, pulling back against the vehicle, and that's causing uh, some drag force as well. So as I mentioned, next video, we're gonna go into this in great detail. And it's important to note, you know, a vehicle like this, when it's traveling, will have this lift force. So the faster you go, you'll actually find your car is actually lifting off the ground. And that, again, is why you don't wanna be racing, you know, conventional vehicles, because they're not really designed to go fast. You'll start to lift the vehicle off the ground the faster that you go. Okay, now the final thing we're gonna look at is spin. And now that we understand the basic physics I think it's gonna be a little more simple to discuss the influence of spin. And again, I like it's I'm not saying the only application here is sporting balls, but like golf balls and baseballs are just such an excellent example of what's going on here. So when you hit a golf ball, it has a huge amount of backspin. And the idea, just a quick summary of the objective in golf, right? You're trying to get that little white ball into the hole that can be some distance away. So when you hit this ball, I've shown Greg Norman there on the left hitting a golf ball. He's trying to get the ball like way down here. So you want it to travel as far as possible. So we've already seen how the dimples on it will create a turbulence that dramatically reduce the drag. But what you can do with this backspin, so we've shown backspin here. So here's a ball traveling with backspin like this and the ball itself is actually traveling like this way because we're showing the velocity traveling back against it. So what the spin actually does is it sort of moves the wake. So the separation point is here and here. So you have now the velocity that's coming along the bottom is actually sort of hindered by this spin direction here. So that velocity will slow down a bit. So it means there's a higher pressure here. And then conversely on the top, you're spinning with the flow. So you're able to delay that separation point farther back here and you're ending up with a lower pressure on the top surface because the velocity is higher now as the ball itself is spinning this way, right? So that higher pressure here, lower pressure here actually causes a lift force. So now when you hit that golf ball with this tremendous backspin, it's actually gonna go a lot higher than it would have traveled otherwise. So it travels higher into the air and that carries it farther down the golf course towards the hole. So of course there are other applications for this as well. Some very creative students um, have come to me in the past and said, okay, well you can do this with a cylinder as well, right? And so you, you can actually have, um, for example, you could make an aircraft, right? With 
rotating cylinders on its side that could generate a lift force just from the rotation, right? You could actually enhance the lift force. So they've tried this. There's some neat videos out there where you have aircraft and just you're rotating cylinders on the side of it to generate your lift force. Okay, so lots of different applications for this type of thing. And again, you know, creativity is rewarded heavily when you think about sort of interesting ways to apply this physics, right? Now, this plot here shows, you know, the corresponding lift and drag with a spin ratio right here. So a few things to note is that you're not paying a very heavy price. You're, you're rough, you could argue you're roughly flat at a certain point when you have an increased spin. It doesn't change the drag by that much. And that's why it's so advantageous because when you look at the lift coefficient, I mean, just look at the dramatic increase you get as your spin ratio is increased. So as you go this way, your lift coefficient just takes off, right? And we're showing a few different curves there that have different Reynolds numbers. Now, this really highlights exactly how a pitcher can throw very effective breaking pitches, like curveballs and sliders. So I'll pull up a video of Clayton Kershaw, actually, who's got a legendary curveball. My son's a lefty as well, so he tends to like watching these left-handed guys throw. Um, so I'll pull that up here. Okay, so I'll hit play here. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, it's just incredible to see those things curve, eh? So, oh, that, that was a great one there. Okay, let's stop. That's enough, I think, for now. Okay, so what is going on here? Okay, now let's look at the mechanics of a curveball for a second. Now, when you throw a curveball, a curveball is mostly controlled by your thumb and your middle finger, and you'll have your middle finger right across the stitches like this, and then you put your index finger in behind it, so what's known as a 12 to six curveball because the motion will be like on a clock, like from 12 o'clock to six o'clock. And what happens is when you throw it and you release the ball, you end up getting a snap on the front of the ball. So you send it outwards with this forward spinning motion. Okay, and that's the spin in a curveball. And that's why it goes from 12 o'clock to six o'clock. That would be a 12, six curveball right there with that forward spin, because as your middle finger releases it, it snaps towards your thumb, and so the ball spins forward. Okay, now I'll show this graphic of a curveball that I got from this website called Baseball Pitches Illustrated. So at the top, you've got the strike zone. So you see how the curveball does that 12 to six motion right across the strike zone. And at the bottom of this graphic here, we're seeing like a side view. The ball is traveling from left, the pitcher's mound, to the plate at the right. And you can see as it goes from left to right, it has that arc. And then right when it reaches the plate, it drops off more. Now we can see from the view I have here describing backspin, it's exactly the same effect for a curveball, except it's forward spin, right? We put forward spin on it. So it's basically identical, except now you have the higher pressure on the top, lower pressure on the bottom. So forward spin generates downforce and that's what pulls the ball down as it reaches the plate. Now I wanna talk about a slider and then I'll draw a little sketch of it and then I'll use that to explain why if you're really good at this, you can get that break or that curve or that lift force to be more dramatic as the ball reaches the batter. Now let's look at the mechanics of throwing a slider. So why does a slider end up with the spin that it does? So very similar to a curveball, similar grip as well. You have your middle finger on the stitches there, index finger in behind it, and your thumbs on the bottom. But when you release this, instead of a curveball like coming forward, you release it to the side a little bit. So instead of like a 12 to six curveball that comes straight down, you might have a slider that say goes from like two to eight. And it really depends on the pitcher and how they release it. But you release it in this case more on the side. So you have that rotation, right? That has that little bit of forward spin, but you're also having that side spin as well. So when the ball reaches the batter, it'll come across the plate instead of just straight down. So by changing the spin direction, you can change the way the baseball moves. So I'll show the graphic again for a slider here. So we can see it does have some downforce, so it curves down, but it also curves to the side. We see when it crosses the strike zone, it has sort of that like two o'clock to eight o'clock motion. Now I wanna sketch this out with like an overhead view to see like how a pitcher like Clayton Kershaw can get his breaking pitches to be so effective. So let's say we've got like home plate right here, batter's boxes like right here. Let's say the mound's right here. Okay. so. The idea to get a really good slider is he'll throw it and it'll start to travel basically down here. Now he's a lefty, so we gotta think of his slider going this way. And the ball 
you know, is the velocity of the wind traveling this, so the ball itself is going this way, right? And you've got this spin on it. So as we've seen above, the lift force, right, is gonna be in that direction here. So we don't think of the lift force there as lifting it up off the ground. Instead, because of the rotation of the spin, the orientation of that force is a little different. So we look again at this ball here where we talked about, right? And you see when it's spinning in that direction, the lift force is pulling upwards, right? So I've got the same thing drawn down here, right? And you're trying to get the ball from the pitcher's mound, like down towards the batter. So the idea is, look at this plot for a second. You've got the spin times the diameter over two times the velocity. So let's go down here again. So that was this right here. So when you release the ball, you snap your fingers, right? And so this rotational velocity here stays roughly the same as the ball travels towards the batter. The diameter of the ball also does not change. Now, because this ball is spinning so much, you're not getting the effects that we saw from the knuckleball. Because it's spinning so quickly, you're actually getting like an averaging out of the roughness over the surface of the ball. So that roughness is just sort of averaged out now, meaning it's turbulent everywhere. So it's important that it's turbulent all over the surface of the ball, the same way the golf ball is because it's been roughened as well. So you don't have those localized effects because the stitches are spinning quite quickly. Now, what you want is Actually, as the ball is traveling towards the batter, you want the ball to move fairly straight towards the batter. So you saw in some of his breaking pitches, there was like a little bit of curve as it came in, but then in some of those cases, as you hit, you know, right around here, you sort of want it to take a big curve so it's gonna head, you know, change direction dramatically and head this way, kind of like right across the plate, right? So the idea is you wanna have a shift in this lift force. So what does change is the velocity. So a really, really, really good pitcher actually throws a ball out here. So out here, the velocity is a little higher. And as the ball travels in this direction, the velocity decreases because it's got some air resistance, right? So the velocity is going down a bit. And as this velocity goes down, right, this whole number, because it's in the denominator, increases, right? So as the ball is thrown and these things stay the same, the velocity changes, right? So the spin ratio goes up. And the idea is right when it hits right around this point, let's look again at that graph that shows us the relationship between the spin ratio and our lift coefficient, right? So when you throw it, you want the lift force to be lower. And then the idea is you want sort of that dramatic jump in the lift coefficient to be here so that you get a very sharp sort of force pulling on the ball and the batter's not suspecting that. So the lift force is much higher as that spin ratio increases, right? So if you can tap into that as a pitcher, right, you're going to be able to get that curve so it's basically straight the whole way and then just really sharply kind of drops down. And a lot of baseball pitches are based on that, right? The idea that you put the spin in a certain direction and then have the ball head in that direction closer to the batter so that it's more unpredictable. It's harder to hit that ball if they don't know where it's going, right? Um, okay, so that's a great way to demonstrate spin, I think. And then finally, they're showing again a comparison between how you dimple the golf balls. So this plot here is for golf balls and the dimpling looked at a conventional and then a hex pattern. So what these experiments showed is that in the case of the hex, you know, as the spin was increased, you were able to increase the lift coefficient quite a bit, right? And the drag coefficient did go up a little bit, but not super dramatically, right? So you had more of an increase in the lift coefficient. And also you'll notice the hex had a higher lift coefficient, which is what you want, and a correspondingly lower drag coefficient. So the hex was better um, from both the lift angle and the drag angle. The hex were better. Now, so in looking at my golf ball that I use here, I noticed that it has a normal dimpling pattern, right? Just the circles, uh, not the hexagons. And in some cases, so in my case, um, I don't really want a lot of spin. I don't want the forces to be too dominant because if I have some side spin on the ball, so if I hook it or slice it, I don't want it to go too far to the left or right. And so that's just a strategy in golf. You really need to pick how much spin you have. If you hit it really straight, you can afford to have that backspin give you more lift. And so you'd want more spin in that case. So it's really about, again, in knowing the physics, you can even know what kind of a ball to use or what kind of a player you are, right? To know how much spin you have, to know how dominant you want those forces to be, right? When you're playing these sports. Apparently there are some new designs. Callaway's been trying out some new uh, dimpling patterns on their balls. And so again, that's an area where 
understanding of the physics of these things can help us, you know, dramatically improve the designs. And again, it's not it's not only for uh, sports and sporting balls. This this thing is, is broadly applicable. I, I just think these are really good examples of it. OK, so that's it for video 21. And we've roughly finished off there. So the core sort of plots and material for section seven, the next video, we're going to be looking completely at race cars. And so we're going to turn the focus a little bit and talk about applications, right? Really look at how we take the things we just learned and apply them in practice, right? Because that's a key aspect of section seven when we look at external flows and, and the lift and the drag. And so I'll close with a summary of what we saw in video number 21 here. So we started with lift and we talked about how lift is very similar to drag and how the two have a lot of interplay between each other. So we looked at stall a little more closely and talked about how we can design for stall by changing the shape of the airfoil. We looked at the relationship between lift and drag and lift drag polars give us an idea of how, as a designer, we can sort of optimize these designs. We talked about some of the effects due to finite wing shapes. So at the end of the wing or the tip of the wing, you have these trailing vortices. And so we talked about what the vortices do, some strategies to prevent them. Then we talked about takeoff and in particular landing when the aircraft is trying to reduce its velocity. So this gave us an idea of why we use flaps on aircraft and some of the benefits to using flaps. One of which of course is because when you're landing and taking off, you want the maximum lift coefficient, but you don't want that drag throughout the normal flight of the aircraft up in the sky. So you can put those flaps out when you're taking off and landing, but pull them back in when you're cruising. We looked at the profile over a car and talked about how we will focus very closely on that in the coming video where we talk about only race cars. And then we also discussed the effect of spin. So we talked about how backspin can generate lift. So a top spin or a forward spin will generate a downforce or a negative lift. That's used in a lot of sports. We talked about golf and baseball. Tennis as well will have this. And sliders as well. If you change the rotation direction, we'll also have the same thing where the force will pull it sideways now. So we looked at that in a lot of detail and talked about how to throw or how some of the best pitchers can throw really good breaking balls like curveballs and sliders. Okay, and that's all for video number 21. Bye.